the reason why I have this cable connected is I was basically checking if Sasmota is working properly. This is the video for you. Hey guys, a couple of weeks ago I talked about this. This is Sonoff Mini R4, one of the first devices from the Extreme series that I covered in this video. And that was all about EWILink app because, well, let's face it, I was one of the first people to get my hands on it and up until today you were not able to buy one. And since now it's been released to the public and you can jump on IT at website and get yourself one of these for $9.90, I thought it's time for the most relevant video about Sonoff Mini R4, how to flush it with Tasmota and how complicated it is. After all, it's only tiny. As things has changed in Tasmota world, I decided to try something new this time around. I've discovered, after flashing a couple of ESP devices on the side, that there is a new way of flashing things with Tasmota via web interface, so that was something I really really wanted to try and share my impressions. So that's what we're going to use in this video. From my original video and teardown I knew that there is a ESP32 inside, so there was no way of I'm going to use Tasmotizer. Can someone please make a Tasmotizer for ESP32? Pretty please? Also, after closer inspection I discovered there are some dev pads, which is a nice thing, but there is no GPIO, which means you're gonna need some tools to carry out the flushing. You only have to do it once, but nonetheless. Speaking of tools, this is where I have perfect opportunity to chill a little bit, because it's gonna be for your and my benefit, of course. So, there's a couple of tools you need. We're going to obviously start with FTD flusher, and please, please, those things aren't terribly expensive. You can get a very nice, decent one. I'm going to link them in the description of this video for about two to five dollars. Do yourself a favor and get a good one, because my number one email inquiry about, well, inability to flash something with Tasmota is usually resolved by using a really good FTD serial adapter. And if you think I was done shilling, you're gonna need one of these. Not this particular, but I would strongly um, I encourage you to get a TS-101 a soldering iron, which is here. But any soldering iron will do, as long as you can actually have a tip small enough to reach to the death pads. They're only tiny. So if you're planning on dabbling in electronics now and then, that's gonna be one of the best investments. You also need a couple of wires to get everything connected and few alternative things if you want to do things like that on a regular basis. I have this fancy toolbox from Jimmy Home which have everything including prying tools and I would strongly recommend you to get yourself a multimeter. You don't have to get anything fancy, this $10 one on AliExpress will do just fine and honestly I was using it for pretty much everything. Anyway, job's done, let's get started. As this is a single channel, relay is pretty much as simple as it gets. Plus, exposed dev pads help because, well, by default, we already have three of the dev pads available in there. My hand started with actually locating the power supply uh, pin because it wasn't exposed anywhere, or at least I thought it wasn't exposed. And after probing a couple of other pads exposed on the main um, PCB, I've discovered that under U2, uh, you can actually submit power. And how did I discover that, you might ask? Well, I did download the data sheet for ESP32 DOWD V3, which is the ESP inside this, and I traced the VDD pin from the data sheet to that U2 dev pad using continuity uh, meter mode on my multimeter. You see, I told you it's gonna be useful. I already suspect that the GPIO is connected to the bottom, as with most of some of the devices, so all I have to do is just press it down when powering the device to get it into a boot mode so you can start flashing. So what's left to do really is start soldering. Those dev pads are tiny, so it took me a couple of attempts to actually do it right. Keep the temperature of your soldering iron between 300 and 330 and you'll be just fine. Once the cables are sorted to the TX, RX, ground and U2, make sure that your FTD flasher is set to 3.3 volt. 5 volts can actually kill your ESP, so, so bear that in mind. At this point the mapping is very simple, connect VCC to the U2, then TX to RX and RX to TX, because why not, and lastly ground to ground. 
and do not, I mean, do not power this device using mains. Your FTD flasher should have enough current to actually wake the device and make everything possible. If it doesn't happen, well, chances are you've got crap FTD flasher. I told you, get proper one. Before we open the web interface, one more warning. Now, web interface won't make a backup of your firmware, and you're going to need that backup if you ever want to go back to the EWLink functionality. I don't know why you would, but, you know, just in case. Now, bear in mind that this firmware backup is linked to your MAC address, so you won't be able to download anything from the internet and use someone else's backup to restore it to original functions. So, at this point, you can either take a dive and carry on without the backup because you like to live your life dangerously, just like me. Or switch over to CLI tools, which I'm going to link in the description of my article, and then you'll be able to use ESP tools to make a proper backup and continue flashing if you prefer to do it this way. I know already that I'm not going to go back, so I'm just going to risk it and use the web interface and flash my firmware. Now you can select any firmware that you seem to like it most, especially the language versions, if you prefer to stick with Tetasmoda in your language. However, do check out the drop-down menu because it will tell you whether the selected firmware is compatible with your IC. Now remember, this is ESP32. Once everything is set up, simply hold down the button and then power on your Sonoff BNR4 so you would enter boot mode. Then press the button, authorize USB connection via web browser, and three minutes later, you'll have Tesmota installed on your device. There you have it. We are almost done. At this point, your Sonoff Mini R4 will reboot, and a couple of things can happen in here. Mostly, it probably won't boot and it won't show you SSID AP point to which you can connect. That will strongly depend on how strong is your USB and how much current you can output. These devices are quite power hungry when the Wi-Fi is involved, so that might not happen. So if everything went okay and you didn't see any errors, you can desolder the wires that you uh, soldered before to the dev pads and reassemble the device and connect it to mains following the instructions. Do not, please, do not leave those cables soldering and do not try to power the device without an enclosure. I like your life. I prefer you alive. I mean, who's gonna generate the revenue from all the ads that you're watching right now? Who? Once you've got it powered, you should see the new IP pointer with the SSLED saying something about task motor and then some random string of letters. And there will be no password, but you have to navigate to a new IP address, which is 192.168.4.1. This is basically the IP address of the host, in this case, Son of Mini R4 running task motor. Select your Wi-Fi, enter your credentials and device will reboot once again, but this time connected to your Wi-Fi. Now you can use something like Thing Desktop app to discover your devices and find your newly created Tasmotized Son of Mini R4 and connect to it. You can also use hostname if you prefer. The next step obviously is to tell Tasmota what kind of device you are using because it's not going to be in a drop-down list because it's too new and configure everything. And how do you usually do that? Well, there are a couple of things. So of the, and how do you usually do that? Well, there are a couple of options. Some are more tedious than not. If you're not interested in tedious, there's gonna be a template that you can copy and paste, head to my website to copy it because you're not going to type all those rows of ones from the video. And that's it, you don't reboot the device and you can start using it. But if you want to play a detective and find out for yourself or learn how to do it for yourself, there are a couple of ways of doing it. Some ways are more tedious than the others, so you'll have to excuse me while I'm trying to explain this. I usually start with a data sheet and make a list of all the GPIOs that are marked as GPIOs because they are more likely to be selected for controlling devices or acting as an input. Over the time I flashed so many different sort of devices I kind of know what are the ranges of pins that they use for what. It's kind of a standard, they probably have it as well, so it's easier for me than it's gonna be for you. To make it less tedious the multimeter comes in handy because it allows you to trace individual pins on uh, ESP32 to actual outputs and inputs on the device and that way you can verify that the GPIO you're trying to understand or trying to map it's actually connected to something. 
And if that fails, or I don't have a physical access to the pin because it's hidden away in some crevices, then good old guesswork is also an option because at the end of the day, there's uh, several different pins that you can mark as a, a relay and sooner or later you're gonna come across the correct one. It's not the best approach, but it works and <laughs> you only have to do it once. Then you have a configuration for a specific device. Now that I have Tasmotized Sonoff Mini R4, I can start using it with Node-RED. I have lots of tutorials and everything about that, so do check it out. I assume you're gonna watch this tutorial once more again when you receive uh, one of yours. So if you haven't ordered yours already, you can go to the description, click on my link, and that will take you to the listing for Sonoff Mini R4. And it will also tell idea that I've sent you, which is great, because that way they like me even more. Right, that's pretty much everything I've got for today, but if you want to know what next, I have this little Raspberry Pi case, which probably you want to know more about, and this little screen that I'm also going to talk about very soon. So why don't you use the YouTube tools provided to keep in touch, stay subscribed, and all that jump. You know how YouTube works, there is no point of me explaining. But I do have a social media on which I share snippets and previews of my work, so if you want to know all that information, before it's available on YouTube. That's the way it all works. See you there, start a conversation, say hi, and I'll see you next video. Thanks so much for watching. Bye.